Hello for lover, you're listening to Pacific Waves from RNZ Pacific, or Lo Ingo, or Susanna Suisuiki. Coming up. Oceans is under significant threat from human activities, if you like. Marine biodiversity gets a lifeline with High Seas Treaty. Also, Bougainville's upset as PNG plans absolute votes on independence. And later on... We pride ourselves in Pacific Islanders. We chat with Chiefs member Tupova Ai ahead of the Super Rugby Pacific Final. But first up, some brief updates from around the Pacific, where in Fiji, its national carrier Fiji Airways has claimed top honours as the best airline in Australia and the Pacific in the Skytrax Awards announced in Paris. In 2022, Fiji Airways was ranked third in the region, behind Qantas and Air New Zealand. It's the first time Fiji Airways has carried off this award. It also retained the award for the Skytrax Best Airline Staff in Australia and the Pacific for the third year in a row. Fiji Airways has also improved its ranking in the global top 100 airlines, finishing ahead of Qantas, British Airways and Air New Zealand. Meanwhile, Solomon Airlines has established a co-chair agreement with near neighbour Air Vanuatu, enabling both airlines to sell seats on a new flight between Port Vila and Auckland. Lydia Lewis has the story. Air Vanuatu now flies three times weekly between the two places following the addition of a third service on Mondays. Solomon Airlines CEO Gus Kraus says they can now offer easy travel from Solomon Islands to New Zealand, flying same day from Honiara to Auckland via Port Vila and vice versa. He adds flights from New Zealand also have potential to rapidly bring benefits at a time where the Solomon's tourism industry is in recovery from recent events. Air Vanuatu recently restarted Thursday direct flights between Brisbane and Santo, with the new route also operated by Solomon Airlines. The world is another step closer to protecting 30% of its oceans after the Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction Treaty was adopted by the United Nations in New York. The agreement, more commonly known as the High Seas Treaty, gained large supports from the Pacific. Caleb Fotheringham has more. Pacific Islands Forum Secretary General Henry Puna was one of the people who celebrated the adoption of the treaty, saying it recognises the special connection people in the region have with the ocean. Also in support was Pacific Network on Globalisation Coordinator Maureen Penjuli, who says it's important considering the various threats the ocean faces. She says there needs to be a level of consistency to how the high seas are governed. Oceans is under significant threat from human activities, if you like, both from a pollution perspective, but more significantly in terms of climate emergency and new emergency threat. So this new treaty is an absolute welcome and extremely timely. Its adoption follows UN member states agreeing to the treaty text in March, nearly two decades after negotiations started. The agreement has created the framework to protect 30% of the world's oceans by 2030, a goal made in December by the UN Convention of Biological Diversity. World Wildlife Fund New Zealand Chief Executive Kayla Kingdom Bibb says Pacific nations will reap the benefit of healthy high seas. We know that the health of our ocean and the blue Pacific is really central to the well-being of Pacific peoples, economically, culturally and environmentally. And marine species like whales, sharks, turtles and tuna range freely between our national waters and the high seas. The agreement will be open for signatures from the 20th of September and will come into force after being ratified by 60 states. However, Kayla Kingdom Bibb says there's a lot of work to do to reach the 30 by 30 goal, with only 1% of the high seas currently protected. Once the adoption process is finished and the individual countries ratify, we can get on to set about proceeding down the pathway that's been set out in the treaty to create marine protected areas in international waters. Pacific Network on Globalisation's Maureen Penjuli hopes the treaty will come into force next year. A cabinet minister in Bougainville is furious with the Papua New Guinea government deciding to make a vote on independence and absolute majority instead of the agreed simple majority. 
Last week, the PNG Minister of Bougainville Affairs, Manasseh Makiba, made a long-awaited and welcomed parliamentary statement on Bougainville's independence referendum, committing to tabling the documents before the end of this year. PNG MPs will be asked in coming years to vote on the independence question based on negotiations over the referendum outcome. But Makiba angered Bougainville by announcing changes to the nature of that vote. Bougainville's Minister of Independence Mission Implementation, Ezekiel Massat, told Don Wiseman what has upset him so much. The minister's statement has changed a majority from a simple majority to an absolute majority. We think that it's unfair that we haven't been consulted on, on the change in terms of the majority to have the matters ratified on the floor of the House. When the matters come before Parliament, for ratification. It was agreed by the National Parliament and our House of Representatives that the majority vote would be a simple majority in terms of ratification. Unbeknown to us, the minister and the NEC have gone ahead and through the minister's statement announced that the majority for ratification will be an absolute majority, which is quite a difficult task to achieve. And therefore, we are unhappy about that particular aspect. We think whilst the NSC has the uh, authority to initiate matters that goes before Parliament, it's a matter that should have been uh, run past our side, and we could have that uh, argument of whether it should be a simple majority or an absolute majority. Uh, we ran with the simple majority because that was the agreement from the two parliaments. Now, an absolute majority, that becomes extremely difficult. It becomes extremely difficult. Whilst I do not uh, intend to speak for the autonomous government at this stage, subject to the Executive Council and the House kicking off on some uh, issues, let me put it quite clearly that whilst we have been uh, happy with progressive Prime Minister, uh, what has transpired in the last national parliament does not give us any comfort at all that independence will be achieved under Marape as the Prime Minister. The president and the government can make a formal statement later on, but as minister responsible for independence, what has transpired, what has come out from the minister and the prime minister in the last national parliament uh, gives us no comfort that we can achieve independence under Marape as the prime minister. We have a joint supervisory body that's coming up on the 6th and 7th of July. Hopefully some of these issues can be resolved at the joint supervisory body because Uh, they are, in my view, putting as much obstacles in front of Bougainville as possible. And that joint supervisory bodies meeting where? In Medang, Medang province. And what other issues are before it? The normal uh, drawdown issues, powers and functions, money issues. Can we talk about the money issues? In, In terms of what the Minister has recently said in Parliament, talking about the supposedly vast amounts of money that Bougainville's getting, but you're saying next to nothing is coming through from Port Moresby. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. The national government every year beats its chest in, in saying Bougainville is getting the largest slice of the national budget. But when you look at it, the funds come trickling in. And I'm talking about the normal appropriations. I'm not talking about the 100 million per year commitment from the prime minister for the next 10 years. That's an issue on its own. You mean that's also money that hasn't been paid? That hasn't been paid. Now, Don, I also bring you back to a, an argument about the outstanding restoration and development grant. That's a constitutionally guaranteed uh, funding that the national government is supposed to give to us. There was an argument in terms of what's the correct amount, and it was based on a, uh, arguments about the formula. Now, the two governments agreed that the United Nations would mediate and we would accept the ruling from the mediator in terms of the formula. And up to, up to 2018, the mediator, being UN, gave its pronouncement. And up to 2018, the national government owed us 800 million kina up to 2018. Now, it's now 2023. Listen, the amount would have gone past a billion kina. And that's the constitutionally guaranteed restoration development grant. So, like, unfortunately, which money do you want to talk about? Uh, Unfortunately, it's been falling short of our expectation. We're having problems with the normal budget. We have problems with uh, Prime Minister's commitments. And we also have problems with the constitutionally guaranteed restoration and development grant. To sports... 
Scott Robertson is chasing a fifth straight Super Rugby title and fairy tale finish to his record breaking stint with the Crusaders. And the coach is confident they're up to the challenge of beating top qualifiers, the Chiefs, in tomorrow night's final in Hamilton. Robertson believes the Crusaders are at their best in big games and says preparing for a final never gets boring. No. <laughs> no, 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 it never gets old. Well, these weeks are special in their own in their own way. You make it special. It's a, it's a one-off game. You've got to enjoy it. Uh, you know you're walk, walking into a pressure environment and Crusaders love these moments. Meanwhile, the Chiefs will need a strong start, consistency and to expand their physical game early against the Crusaders in the 2023 Super Rugby Pacific Final on Saturday. That's according to Chiefs and All Blacks lock Dubova Ai, who's of Tongan heritage, preparing for his first Super Rugby final. Vaai, who's also been renamed in the All Blacks squad, believes his first Super Rugby final is also an important one for him personally, with his family's support and sacrifices fresh in his mind. He's one of several Pacific Islanders who will be part of the Chiefs' attempt to win their first Super Rugby title since 2013. RNZ Pacific senior sports journalist Elias Satora spoke with Va'ai about the final clash and what it means to him. Well, congratulations uh, on a very good season this year, um, going into the finals against the Crusaders. How do you rank uh, your performance and the, and the Chiefs' performance so far uh, getting into the final on Saturday? Uh, no, yeah, the season's been awesome. Um, we've, we've had a few years that we've um, been in trouble, and um, I think that's all part of the process. And I think we've slowly started to reap the re- uh, rewards that uh, we have got to share. And um, yeah, we're just truly grateful that we've got the wins on our belt, and um, that gives us confidence heading into this. You have an, a, a few other Tongan boys in the Chiefs uh, uh, Chiefs lineup. How how has that connection? How has that uh, been for for you and the other Tongan boys who are in the team? Uh, it's awesome. Um, not just the Tongan boys, but all the Pacific Island brothers uh, that um, out there. Is just, you know, we, we bring the physicality, and that's what we pride ourselves in um, as Pacific Islanders. And uh, it's awesome, awesome to see the brothers out there, um, you know, performing well. And um, I guess that's just a connection thing of the PR. We so, yeah. What do you think you and the Chiefs would need to do to be able to um, stop the Crusaders uh, on on Saturday? I think our um, carry and clean up games needs to be strong and um, we kind of uh, uh, learned from uh, from the semi final against the Blues that they, they were physical so um, that's that's one key area they were trying to target and um, obviously the set piece, set piece goes a long way and, um, and a bit of our kicking game as well. You you also uh, been named in the All Blacks uh, squad to prepare for uh, the championship matches that are coming up uh, and you would be obviously playing against some of your uh, uh, World Cup teammates uh, in the Crusaders. Uh, how does that feel? Oh, I guess um, yeah. I've actually been thinking that. I uh, think about that a lot. And I guess we still got uh, we're still enemies at the end of the day. And then um, once we head into camp next week, and I'm sure we'll we'll be teammates again. So um, yeah, at the moment my focus is uh, just trying to put a good performance out there this weekend for our fans to be proud of, and not just for them, but also our families as well. And um, yeah, I'm pretty sure we'll be made up for the game. So yeah. How how has been the, the family support uh, uh, to Paul uh, on you as you've gone through the season? and also obviously looking forward to the rest of the season possibly the World Cup uh, it's massive um, you know I definitely can't repay the, the sacrifices that my um, that my parents and my family have um, done to get me to this um, point in my career and um, you know I'll give pretty much all the glory back to the man above and um, without him and the blessing of the talents that I have now I, I wouldn't be able to do what I do uh, today and uh, yeah I, I still can't repay the you know the faith and um you know, the stuff that, that's been going on behind the scenes and that sort of thing. But yeah, massive, massive uh, gratitude to my parents and uh, my family for this. Obviously, a lot of uh, people back home in Tonga would be watching the Super Rugby final mm-hmm. on Saturday. What message would you like to give them? Uh, just thank you for your continuous support. Uh, you know, keep, keep supporting us and um, I'm sure we'll make you guys proud. That's Pacific Ways for today. To listen back, head over to rnzi.com slash programs. You can also download us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and iHeartRadio or wherever you get your podcasts from. So from myself and the team here at RNZ Pacific, to Fasoi Fuwa.